Hello, producer life here dropping a quick line to say that we had some audio issues with today's episode that resulted in short random cuts. We apologize and are working to resolve the issue. We also have a trigger warning for today's show. Our guest reflects on her personal loss and the challenges that women face in South Africa from HIV AIDS to rape. Viewer discretion advised. Hello and welcome to the Play It Board podcast presented by Peace Players, the podcast where we lift up voices and stories of people working in their communities and network to promote peace and equity. I am Chinny Nawagbo, your host, and I am so excited for today's show because we've got the one and only I mean, I don't want to give it away right now. I don't want to give it away right, right, right now, right, but we right, got, right, right. you know, the origin, original starting from the seed here, who just is just going to be amazing for us today. So I'm excited about that. And that being said, let me tell you what I'm talking about. I'm excited for today's conversation and topic of discussion because we have a very special guest joining us who will take us on a phenomenal journey and share bits and pieces of the origin of peace players peace players in South Africa and through the looking glass of her powerful and magnificent magnificent life we will learn so much so I'm excited to be here it's gonna be a hopefully not a teardropper but mm -hmm. <laughs> one of those mm -hmm. things where you just pat your chest because you know you're connected with with our guests but before we do that um I mean where would I be where would I be without introducing the most amazing co-host in the world Emmett Shepard. <laughs> yeah, round of applause. Okay, guys, stop. Oh my God. Please, please. Oh please. my God, the fans are too loud. <laughs> they are. Uh, I'm sipping coffee are. right now. It's a little early where I am, so we'll do a little ASMR first. Mm, Jenny, I am feeling great. I don't know about you, but it's, God, it feels good to be back. You know what I mean? It's season two. I miss my listeners. I have separation anxiety. So this is good that we're finally, you know, back in the ball, getting the ball rolling. And, um, uh, I have a very personal connection with today's guest and she's like a second mom, like a best friend to me. And so yeah, Jenny, yeah. without further ado, let the people, let the people know who we're talking to today. Okay. Um, you, you know, I'm going to try my very best and I'll give you just a brief introduction, but there's so much more, um, so many wonderful layers, uh, about this human. So our guest today was born and raised in the province of Eastern Cape and now resides in KwaZulu Natal, South Africa. She is a young woman who has dedicated her life to social development to help advance youth and women's advocacy through interactions and sports. Learn and share her experience with people people that come from diverse backgrounds and find solutions to some of the most pressing issues that young people face. And if Drake were here, he would say she started at the bottom from being a participant with Peace Player South Africa and now is at the top, the tippity top, as the executive director of Peace Player South Africa. Please help me welcome Nasipi Nas, we'll call you, Kwafu. Welcome to the show. I feel like Ooh. there should be like wow. drums and people yeah, just yeah. dancing and just bringing this name wow, in and lifting you up. We are so excited, so excited to have you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. No, thank you guys for having me. Thank you for the invite to be on the show. Absolutely. I cannot believe I am here. You guys do a fantastic job. I'm just really, really excited to have a conversation with the two of you and the world of Peace Players family uh, today. So thank you so much. Absolutely. Well, it's good. You know, we were choosing between you and Oprah and we chose you. So I feel oh uh, pretty good. Now. I mean, first I was like, who? Oprah who? But yeah, yeah. Um. Oh, that is, <laughs> so we're happy. that is very kind. That is very yeah. kind. <laughs> um, and and, and I, I'm sure you've listened to the show before and um, he's kind of stretching, you know, you know, running his hands through his hair. And um, <clears throat> we always like to start to show off with our number one and only in the world. Uh, icebreaker king mm. um and his name is well you're looking right at him mm -hmm. emmett emmett shepherd so how it's gonna work is i'm gonna ask you an icebreaker gonna break the ice self-explanatory i know um and then we'll just dive into our conversation so today's icebreaker let me stretch yes, a little stretch, bit stretch stretch get get ready oh, okay. get ready okay so Nas, what message would you put on a billboard that thousands of people would see every day? What would wow. be your message? Wow. How big yeah. is a billboard? 
It can be <laughs> gigantic. Let's say it's Big gigantic. Like. Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, I think I would put, uh, I think one of my maybe mini philosophies, mm. I always say that God makes no, God makes no mistakes. Amen to that. Um, mm. I think that's what I would put in a very gigantic billboard. And mm. I think that that stems from maybe you get to hear some of it uh, today, like some of my life, some of the yeah. adversities that I faced. And yeah. that is one thing that has kept me positive uh, and yeah. going that just believing that uh, God makes no mistakes, whatever it is, he's prepared me for it. Take, if anything, it is a lesson and a preparation for even a greater, uh, great, greater comeback or yeah. story uh, ahead yeah. of me. So I think that's what I'll put forward. I'll put in oh a big forward. I'm oh taking God, God. that. I'm taking yeah. that energy, uh, Nas, and I'm and I'm and I'm accepting it. Yes, absolutely. I oh love God, that. It's five minutes in, and we've already had a drop. <laughs> this is going to be. This is going to be deep. Yeah. Um. What 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 awesome. color scheme would you do for your billboard? Just very curious. Like, what's the colors of the billboard going to look like for you? Please don't call me boring. I'll make it a white background written in bold font in black. No, that's yeah, perfect. No, 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 no. Simplicity. Simplicity is what you need to get your message across sometimes. No, I completely agree. Yeah. Bold wow. is definitely the way to go. Oh my God. Um, so let me start by getting the ball rolling a little bit, Nas. So I, you know, for those of you who don't know, which I don't know why you would um, listening to this, but um, Nas is like a second mom and even weirder, like a best friend at the same time uh, to me. And was technically my boss at the same time. So there are these three avenues of a relationship that I had with her that I felt super lucky to have. And, um, you know, I originally was a fellow in South Africa. I was supposed to be there for two years and I ended up only being there for two and a half months, um, really one and a half months that I remember because the first month and a half, as me and Nas would joke about, was just like a complete blur. Like you don't really remember the first month because it's such a culture shock. There's so much going on. You kind of get thrown into the fire and you start doing all this different work, um, but it was amazing. And so one thing, you know, that I want to just speak to you directly, Nas, about is just you as a mentor and you as a friend when I was in the position that I was in and just seeing what you did on a daily basis and how many wheels you were turning and how many, you know, just people you were overseeing while also being just like a best friend, a boss and like a motherly figure. I was just like, I need, I gravitated towards you as a person. Like you were so yeah. inspirational. Right. You were so <laughs> compassionate yeah. and empathetic. And it truly made like my transition and just like my overall experience a thousand times better. And, um, there's always going to be a part of me in South Africa, partially very much due to you as a person. And so I just wanted to thank you That's for keeping awesome. an eye out on me and uh, for helping me navigate South Africa a little bit. So what I'm curious with, and I think a lot of listeners are, Nas, and what I want to start with is sort of uh, you as a person and sort of exploring sort of uh, that aura of inspiration and resilience that I felt for you when I saw you. And more so exceptionally, the hard work that you put in on a daily basis and the discipline that you have. And so um, my first question, which has been this long winded whole thing, mm -hmm. but basically is just like, can you tell me a little bit more about your story and where you came from and sort of that journey for us, yeah. for me, us for Ginny and for our yeah. listeners? Yeah, yeah, I'm interested. Please walk us through. Yeah, so definitely. Uh, so uh, Ginny already introduced me that I'm from the province of the Eastern Cape. Uh, just for anyone, maybe if I can paint a visual picture, uh, I usually, I used to call it, it's where the sun does not shine because it's quite far, grew up in the mountains, uh, I used to walk about 20 kilometers to school, um, barefooted most of the time, uh, it's in the wow. rural areas, uh, so very community-based, uh, we truly believe that a child is, in the saying that a child is raised by a village where mm -hmm. if I did something, my neighbors and everyone was like my parents uh, growing mm -hmm. up. And I was raised by my grandparents. My mother got pregnant with me when she was 19 in high school. Mm -hmm. And because she had to find employment uh, to support me, my grandfather was very strict. Uh, so when my mom got pregnant, she got kicked out of home, uh, was wow. staying with extended families, had to 
find a way to make it for herself until she gave birth to me. And I think my grandparents only accepted me when I was two years old, uh, just because I was this little cute bundle of joy holding on to <laughs> my grandfather's uh, leg and not letting him go. And then I was like, okay, I guess we will accept her. And uh, I was raised by my grandparents that way uh, in the villages in the Eastern Cape. I was there until we kept traveling because my grandfather was also an engineer in Durban, which is a city in Guazulu Natal province. So I used to travel to Durban for during school holidays, just on vacation. Uh, that's how I got introduced initially to Durban. And when I was uh, 15 years old, I officially moved uh, to Durban to do my grade 10. Uh, growing up in the Eastern Cape, I played all sports. I ran, I did athletics, I played netball. I was very good at netball. Unfortunately, I had to stop because um, of the very short dresses. I did not want to wear short dresses, even though I enjoyed the sport. <laughs> I played soccer, I played cricket, whatever sport um, that there was, I just made sure that I was involved. It was uh, When I was in uh, grade 11, I was 18 years old, and for the first time, I saw basketball on TV, nice. and my eyes went big. I couldn't believe, um, I'm from most listeners, if you're not from, from Europe, uh, especially in the UK, Australia, or South Africa, you might not know what is netball. It's very similar to basketball, except... Yeah. Uh, the rules are quite different. Mm. Uh, so when I saw basketball, I realized that it looked just like netball. I got very excited uh, to be introduced to the sport. Um, I remember my first practice uh, at Peace Players. A friend of mine from school introduced me to Peace Players. Obviously, I was walking barefoot. Uh, I was wearing a skirt, not wearing proper uniform. And I just held this orange ball and I couldn't believe that I had it in my hand. And that's when I got introduced to Peace Players uh, that way. And uh, since then, sport has been my everything. It has been my escape um, when I went through everything that I've went through in my life uh, that you'll get to hear about it um, just now. But uh, my, my basketball just gave me that home and hope and the place of belonging uh, where mm -hmm. I felt like I was not judged based on coming from the rural areas, not speaking English uh, mm -hmm. properly. I was not judged because my self-confidence and issues that I had uh, mm. as a teenager thinking I'm not beautiful or anything it was just yeah. on the court I felt like I belonged um, and it didn't matter uh, where I was everyone just wanted to to wanted me to be a part of the team and that made me feel safe yeah mm -hmm. very nice very wonderful story um and yes we we will definitely dive in far more but I just thank you for sharing that um yeah. I'm happy that um at two your grandparents were like you know what there's no way we can't love you there's no way we can't accept you so that was yeah. very nice um and it's so to hear netball because my parents my parents are Nigerian uh listeners uh they played netball <laughs> growing oh, up and I'd be like netball so yeah. yeah you know they're not yeah big time netball fans um and that being said and just hearing that um I want to transition to this um there's an African proverb that reads Teeth do not see poverty, which means when circumstances are dire, people still find something to smile about, something to give thanks for. And I mentioned this proverb because it's clear um, that you faced a lot of challenges in your life at a, a very young age. And yet your story embodies an indefatigable will to, to, to power forward despite hardships, right? I, I, which I think are absolutely brilliant. And moreover, uh, I think the word that best illustrates you, I'm um, just hearing your story and being with you these few minutes is resilience, right? Um, and that being said, I am so interested because I wanna just be able to pull and extract from some of your wisdom, your why, I wanna know your why. Um, what keeps you motivated despite hardships and setbacks? Uh, because I think that yeah. part of your life will be something that we can all resonate from and learn from. Yes, definitely. I think uh, what keeps me going, uh, especially now, um, I'll just, I'll uh, please forgive me, I'll keep going back and forth so that the, the story connects. So after I moved from the Eastern Cape, I moved to Durban. Uh, for the first time in my life, I got to live with my mother. Yeah. Uh, I had never, I've only seen my mom when she came home once a month, once every three months, um, as a person who was also a breadwinner at home to, to, drop off money uh, to assist my grandparents. Um, and my mom, when I think when I was three, she married my father, my brother's father. Mm. 
So we never really had a relationship just because I was always in the Eastern Cape with my family. So when I officially moved to Durban, I was extremely excited that for the first time I'm going to live with my mom. Uh, I had all of these dreams and how our relationship was going to be. Um, I envisioned it all my life. So I was very excited. And when I moved to Durban, that wasn't the case. Uh, My mom didn't know how to first to be a parent to to me. And she had a lot of resentment because um, I felt that she felt that maybe I put her life on, on hold. Yeah. Uh, she could not finish high school. She didn't finish her matric because she was pregnant with me. And I remember growing up, uh, just we used to clash a lot. Oh, and yeah. I used to say, because we're very, we're very similar, a very strong willed. Um, yes. And I used to say to her, my mom, I will finish high school without getting pregnant. I will make sure that I go to university, uh, I get a degree. And I get a job, you know, I just always wanted this world that my mom couldn't have and the world that I wanted to make sure that was possible for me, uh, that I was able to have access to that world. And uh, for the first year, I stayed first 2014, no, 2004, uh, 2005, my mom and I were struggling. Uh, personalities, we, were, we didn't have a good relationship at all. we we'll go yeah. for months on end without speaking to each other. And uh, one of the reasons why I believe that God makes no mistakes um, uh, for real is that my grandmother, who was my best friend, passed away in 2004 from diabetes. Oh, yeah. um, my mom amazing. was also diabetic. No, thanks, Jenny. My mom was also diabetic at the time. Um, and then after my grandmother passed away, that actually gave me an opportunity to build a relationship with my mom that I would have never, because right. I didn't care for her. Uh, uh, Chad would say I saw her as an, as an object. I wanted what I wanted from her. I I didn't really care much for her. And from that point, I realized that she was all I have and I had to make it work with her. Uh, So 2016 was actually, uh, 2006, uh, apologies. Uh, And she was also diabetic. And sadly, at the end of that year, she passed away as well. (sighs) And what I'm really grateful for is that I had that opportunity of a year and a half to have a relationship with her that I would have never had. She became my best friend. I would have never thought that was possible. And what was really tough with that moment, uh, I started also reflecting on that my mom had me when she was 19. If she didn't have me, there would have been no one to take care of my grandmother and her when they were awfully ill from diabetes, taking them in and out of hospitals. Uh, And I remember the day my mom passed away, it was right in front of me um, with my siblings. We couldn't get an ambulance in time and eventually an ambulance came. And I remember the guy saying that, we don't know why you're calling us now. This lady died a long time ago, you know, and I just remember realizing, I think that's when maybe this resilience was born, just realizing that I had to, I was all I have and I was all my siblings had. I had to, to step up and just be a grown up from the age of 18. Um, I had to, I looked at my sister who was five at the time, my brother who was 15 and my cousins in the, in the house, in the flat that we're share that we're all sharing and just realizing that uh, in the next, I need to find an undertaker to come pick up my mother's body. Yeah. I had to go tell my family that my mom has passed away, plan a funeral, um, yeah. tell her coworkers and all of that. So from that point, on i realized i had my childhood sort of stopped i realized i had to be an adult uh, and take care of this transporter body to the eastern cape make all the arrangements while i was in metric myself i was in grade 12 uh figuring out how my i was start i was finishing high school the following year how my brother would finish high school how my sister would start school as well and we're staying in a flat we got kicked out of the flat obviously because we couldn't afford rent um, trying to find how can we find a home and through extended family they housed us until we we're able to finish high school and since then I've just really worked on myself and I knew that I was all I have I cannot afford to fail right. failure right. to me or letting go it means end of my life and right. I'm not ready for my life to end I just continue to plow through like Emmett will tell you even with work I work around hours because I I'm just very I'm very clear on my vision for myself and the vision of the people around me. I want to make sure that I do everything I can to succeed. And it's through these very hard times that I've learned to 
um, to be strong and to go on even when the going gets very, very, very tough. Oh my goodness. Wow. I can't lie to you, uh, Nasipi. In my mind, I'm like, be Oprah, don't cry. I, I you're like, uh, yeah. My my aunt once uh, gave me a, a a compliment, and she's Nigerian, and she called me what I will call you now. It's an Oroko tree. It's this big, huge tree we have in Nigeria. But what's so great about it is its roots are firm in the ground, and because its roots are firm in the ground, it grows big and large, and its branches spread. And it gives life to earth. And that's what your story does for us mm -hmm. here. So mm -hmm. I'm trying See, to be like Oprah like, and not cry. <laughs> yeah, I'm, <laughs> I have glasses on. I don't want to get them foggy. Um, yeah. No, nah, so I, I have two sort of points awesome. that I want to highlight. One is, uh, and again, feel if you don't want to answer, that's totally fine. How it was 20, 2006 when you realized, oh, I need to have a relationship with my mom, how those early stages with that, how long did it take until the script was sort of flipped and she was your best friend? Was it like how much inside outside transformation did you have to go through and stuff like that? Or like, what was that process like for you? Yeah, no, it's a very good question, Emmett. Um, I think what happened was because my grandmother was there, I sort of avoided even attempting to build a relationship with my mother. Mm -hmm. um, and I was so frustrated that I wanted her to see it was all about me, right? I wanted her to <laughs> yeah. see the world from me, how I was hurt, how I felt yeah. abandoned when she wasn't there, how yeah. uh, I'm your daughter. You're supposed to be like your yeah. best friend with your daughter, right? I had all of mm -hmm. these expectations that I created in my head and this perfect relationship that I wanted for us. And when she was not um, giving me that, I just completely rebelled and went the, the opposite direction and just didn't see her as a person at all. Mm -hmm. And um, after my grandmother passed away in 2004, I realized that I didn't have an escape anymore. I had to yeah. face, I had to Your face fears. my mother. Yeah. Um, I had to face my fears. I remember before my grand passed away, if I asked my mom to to buy me shoes, school shoes or anything. She said no or whatever. And I'll be like, oh, it's fine. I'll go ask my grand anyway, she'll do it. And then I realized that I didn't have that anymore. I have to right. make this relationship work. And I started focusing yeah. on that. And even she would do things that um, if my grandmother was around, if it irritated me, I would automatically shut down. But I started focusing on building that relationship. Even if yeah. she did something I didn't like, I started having conversations with her and sharing how she made me feel and sharing mm -hmm. how much I've missed her, how much I've, I need her in my life right. um, and, and so forth and so forth. And so that helped uh, to sort of accelerate that process. I'm not sure what it would have been if my grandmother was still around. My mother and I had that opportunity to build our relationship. Um, and again, I'm, I'm so thankful to God that he gave me that opportunity because it's something yeah. that I always knew I had to do, but mm -hmm. I kept avoiding because I didn't have to. Um, oh. And really now that now that I realize that um, I'm here, she's here. We need to make it work. Uh, when she passed, I felt like thank you, Lord, for giving me that opportunity to build this relationship. Right. Because I don't think uh, I still struggle with it. It's 15 years later now since my mom passed away. Mm -hmm. I miss her so much, um, yeah. and uh, and I want to be able to have that relationship with her. And I cannot even imagine if I had not given her that opportunity to right. if i didn't if right. i didn't forgive her uh right. if i didn't forgive her and understand the world from her perspective i don't think i would be okay right now yeah well that's yeah. the thing is like and jenny i want to echo what you said it's uh, it sounds like nas like you, your back was against the wall, this sort of crutch that you had, which was your relationship with your grandma was gone. And a lot of people choose in that, that's a moment of fight or flight. You can either right. decide to just go away and say, you know what, I, I don't want to even attempt to get uncomfortable right now. I don't even want to attempt to try to start building a relationship. Right. And like, you're a fighter and you also that's just like having that initial step to talk with your mother is just like that's resilience in and amongst yeah. itself sort yeah, of thing yeah. so that's that's incredible thank you so yeah. much for sharing Jane do you have any thoughts yeah I do I do it, it, it sounds like um your experience and that your loss positioned you uh 
to see people as people. And I, I know you guys are listening. You're going to hear a lot of, of peace players terminology as we go um, throughout the course of this conversation. This it's is not DNA. Is. Uh, it's just, <laughs> it is yeah. not DNA. It is. Right, right. Um. And, 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 and so I, I, I truly um, just love hearing about your, it's an indomitable will, right, to go because you have no other choice. You got people on your back and you must make sure uh, that they succeed. And the only way that they succeed is they've got to kind of, you, you know, you're the source of, you're that light, you're that source for them. So kudos to you. Uh, I want to say that. Great job. Um, and yeah, I mean, you're yeah, still. Um, that's, yeah. I think really also is surrounding yourself with that light because yeah. if uh, there's only so much, it's it's not sustainable. You burn out, you know, yeah. it's also just making sure that you have the, the right uh, people around you. And uh, Peace Players was that family for me, like people like Claire who were coaches at the time or Kristen, right, who right. friends who were fellows um, at the time, just like Emmett, uh, if you heard also Emmett's story, I had people like that within the Peace Players family with my family and the community and my best friend um, right. to stay. And it's so funny, most of my friends, when I tell them the story of when I was homeless uh, and I used to show up at their house to visit, they thought I was visiting. And now I tell them that, no, actually I didn't have a place to go. Wow. <laughs> wow. Why right. do you think I showed up with all of my bags? Right, right, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Right, right, no, I'm right. just visiting, no, I'm just visiting. Right. Yes, at your house. So it was that I, I, I really managed, um, I was, very fortunate to be surrounded by a lot of love and people that really believed in me from nothing. People just, wow. they just right. saw me and, and they wanted me to succeed at all costs. And they, they compromise themselves if they had to, I still have those people now and sacrifice themselves if they have to, because they truly believe in, in, in myself, um, in right. my, in my vision and the things that I want. And they just wanted to, to help me. So when mm. I, I was able to be that light for others, because I have so many other uh, people charging me, making sure that my cup stays full so that I can yeah. um, yeah. pour out for others as well. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it's, it's unique because through all of that, you mentioned sport, right? And sports yeah. being a tool, a, a part of your arsenal that helped you get through that adversity. And so I want to kind of go there uh, and, 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 and listen to or hear how sports specifically ha helped you uh, you know, get through a, a lot of the adversity that you experienced in your life. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, Chini, uh, I, I'd say <laughs> the other day I was looking at how many places I've been to around the world, uh, yeah. countries or continents, and I realized I've never paid for a single trip. <laughs> right. For <laughs> right. for me. Right. Um, yeah, right. So I'm now a qualify. I'm qualified in sport management, yeah. um, and and in youth development. And it's because of sport that I'm able to. Uh, it has enabled me to give back to the people that I give back to. Um, whether it's fellows, my staff in the office, our coaches that are graduates of our program, sport has allowed me to do that. I remember many times. When I was a student, I used to eat one packet of two-minute noodles a day because I couldn't afford food um, mm. and uh, drink water uh, for the rest of the day. In the evening, I'll go to my basketball practice, uh, play basketball until 8 p.m. Obviously, mm. I've had a long day. I'm exhausted. I'll drink water and sleep, um, mm. you know, and I wouldn't feel uh, where else. If I, if I was doing nothing, if I was just uh, in my uh, student accommodation, I would have felt hungry uh, because right. I, I had nothing to do but a uh, sport or my peers even uh, they would bring food on the court so I usually say that mm. sport fed me it gave <sighs> me clothes it gave Absolutely. me a career um, it's uh, I've traveled around the world I felt that um, maybe my life uh, was not I was not fulfilling the purpose uh, that I was created to fulfill when I questioned and doubted myself um, and sport has been that hope and that light for me uh, yes. that, Yes. That continuously showed uh, every time I bounce that ball, it comes back to my hand um, every time. Um, yeah. and it doesn't matter if I, I fumble a dribble, it goes away. I go back, I get it, and I try again until I can get it right. Uh, I've seen that happen in my life when things don't go right. When I don't have food today, I have food tomorrow. And sports has uh, been the reason uh, and enabler for that for me. Um, that has just given me strength to go on 
I've seen immediate results. I build relationships. If I can't afford food, a friend of mine in the court will have food for me yeah. um, uh, to help support me. So sport has been wow. that common wow. thread throughout my life. Yes. Um, but yes. It's sustained me. It's sustained me now to, to where I am. And I'm sure yeah. it's going to continue to do so. And I see Absolutely. it. With the, I'm able, I was able to take up loans and put my sister from, like she was in grade R when my mom passed away, like kindergarten. Uh, she's finished high school now uh, and sport en- was the enabler of that. I was able right. to get other jobs because of that to, to be able to sustain myself and my siblings as well. Sounds mm-hmm. like sports is the legacy for real. I know, yeah. seriously. <laughs> it's also like, you know, like sports, it's like for somebody who's core, one of core foundational like values for them is resilience. You're like, what sports? And it's like, oh, well, basically you're not going to be good at this thing. And then you're just going to have to keep trying. And then eventually you'll get good at it. And people with resilience are like, <laughs> okay, here we go. <laughs> right. How many can I sign up for? You know, right, exactly. Right, kind of thing. Right, right. Uh, now, as before we dive into sort of your relationship with peace players, um, let's take an exhale because we've talked about a lot, yeah. you know, um, and we do this thing on the, uh, on the show. Uh, Chinny, you want to uh, <clears throat> describe? <clears throat> To yeah, her, yeah. What, well, what she's about to go through, the well, gauntlet, well, welcome, if you will. Welcome to the lightning round. Um, and we are, I'll have to put in the sound effects. So exa- yes, you will. Yes, you will. We are so excited to have you. Um, and this is just a light and fun space to be in. Our uh, most amazing icebreaker king and co-host Emmett will ask you a series of questions. And you have three sec, well, three, four seconds max to answer yeah. the questions. <laughs> Three to yes. 20 seconds, but usually <laughs> sometimes people take two minutes, but we'll, we won't talk about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's just fun and light. Uh, and, and yeah, and Emmett has a saying that he says that we will heavily uh, judge you with each one of your answers. So don't worry at all <laughs> with each question. No, we're kidding. We're kidding. Uh, after that, <laughs> we're not kidding. We're not you kidding. know what? Let me stretch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. All you have. All right, Chinny, you got the clock ready? You got it ready? Yes, I'm here. Okay. You got, got the it. pen just in case we got to take some answers down. You know, I got down. the pen. It's always right here. It's always here. <laughs> All right, Nas, right you here. ready? Are you ready, Nas? Yes. Okay, so first I question. So. <laughs> Would you rather score a game winner at home or away? Away. <laughs> away, yeah. She wants to be the villain. I like that. I like that. I'm with her. I'm with her on that regard. <laughs> you know, the crowd is good, but silencing a crowd, Chinny, I don't know what your thoughts on you know, this are. But uh, I'll take both. Me- Give them something to remember us by. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Don't never forget that. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. The CP is bowing to the exactly. to the away crowd. Um, what was the last thing that made you right. smile, <laughs> Nas? Oh, the last thing made me smile. Right now it's you guys. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. I'm smiling awesome. so oh. much. Um, I think I have I have four nephews um right now. So looking at their pictures really makes me smile uh, a lot because awesome. I cannot believe these like my siblings are real humans <laughs> right 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 shouts out the nephews shouts out yes. the nephews <laughs> um all right it's going to start to pick up the speed a little bit you ready here we go yeah all right yeah. coffee or tea coffee morning bird or night owl <laughs> morning bird <laughs> cats or dogs dogs definitely Spring or autumn? Spring. Yeah, oh, nice. Pancakes, waffles, or French toast? Ooh, that is <laughs> tough. Uh, my boyfriend loves waffles, so I think that's the thing lately. Waffles. Okay, that's that's cool. Shouts Very out nice. Mpilo. Shouts out Mpilo. Nice. I agree. Yeah. Um, bungee jumping or zip lining? Zip lining. I am yeah, terrified yeah, yeah. of heights. Terrified Ooh, okay, of heights. Okay, okay. So I feel like that's more safe. <laughs> Yeah. Acceptable. Acceptable. White okay. sand beaches or sky piercing mountains? Mountains. Oh, mountains. Because I grew up mm-hmm. in the mountains. Mm-hmm. Yes. Nice. Mm-hmm. Nice. Space travel or deep sea travel? Oh, space travel. Nice. Oh, okay. Nice. Okay. <laughs> A million dollars or three oh, wishes? Three wishes. Yeah, I like this one. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Any, it could be any three wishes. Any mm-hmm. three wishes. 
three wishes because why have a million when you can wish for 10? No, I was going to say you, you go. can't wish for more wishes, but we'll, I, we'll I was accept say, it. We'll we should probably it. put that. You can't wish for more money, but okay, yeah, okay, okay. Um, singing or dancing? Dancing, for sure. Dancing, yes. Yeah. Reading or writing? Hmm, writing. Nice. Uh, last meal you had that made you go, wow. Wow. Uh, from Ooh. down the road from the office, Emmett. Mm. Penny, mm. when you come, uh, when you make it to South Africa, which I will uh, very, very soon, uh, yes. there's uh, a really cool spot down from our office called Falafel Fundi. They make the best falafels on earth. They my body's like, guys, so my body's falafel. like shaking when you mentioned that. Like <laughs> my body went through withdrawals just now. Um, <laughs> uh, last thing you learned from someone else. Uh, I, I would say is that <laughs> life is not perfect. <laughs> right. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, life is just it's full of, of fumbles and mistakes. It's just how you, you come out mm -hmm. and come up out of those mistakes and right. keep trying. So that mm -hmm. was a good lesson because I used to be very hard on myself mm -hmm. and wanted things to be perfect all the time. So that was a very valid lesson for me. Um, I like that. How you turn your losses into your lessons. Love yeah. that. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. All right, last two. You're almost done. One person who inspires you. Wow. Um, I will not say my siblings. They have inspired me my whole life. But right now, I think um, someone like Serena Williams, um, yes. who yeah. is just against all odds, she remains her best self. Uh, right. She just Firm. really, really... Strong. You know, she just really, really inspires me to keep on and um, to know that there's nothing you can't do that you put your mind in. So, mm -hmm. yeah, um, really, right now, I think that's a person that is um, always in my head whenever I'm faced with adversity. I think mm -hmm. about how she overcomes and how she keeps on going time mm -hmm. and time and time and time again. So, and she's the her. effing goat, if in she case is. anybody wanted to know. <laughs> Goat. The goat is what he said. Goat. Yes. <laughs> Greatest and of all time. Last question, the CV is one thing you want the listeners to remember from today. Oh, wow. Uh, thank you so much. I would like them to remember that uh, Nasif is human. <laughs> uh, she is. Uh, growing, uh, using right. uh, everything that has happened in her life to build her right. uh, to be where she is. And oh. Nasifi remains hungry. Uh, she's continuously building uh, for the next. So uh, just like them to know that, uh, remember resilience, that through that, you are able to become, you're able to build and mm. right. um to you able to be and be yourself so uh, yeah. through it all so resilience you said one thing so i'd say resilience <laughs> and knowing that nasipi is like a tree as chini said she is mm. like, rooted and she is growing any branches as she's getting older. Um, right and she right. provides life for everyone for every, everyone right on. Um, well, I, and I'm, like, whew, I'm excited. I'm like, Emmett, Emmett, can I go? Get it go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I have, yeah, can, get, uh, yeah, that was awesome. So that was that was great. Way to way to get way to get through, through our, it. Way to get through it. Our lightning you round. Got through it. Um, that was and so, tough, yeah, and so, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say. And so, how do you feel? But okay, I'm glad that you had a good time, and uh, it was tough, but you know, fun. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I have a, a a question. I really want to ask uh, Emmett if 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 you're okay with me, just. Uh, so I did some research, and uh, uh, Naz, I know, I, I'm sure you're aware of this, but I want to talk about the disparities amongst boys and girls in South Africa when it comes to sports, specifically the importance of participation uh, in sports for South African girls and how pivotal sports are to their long-term success, not only as individuals, uh, not only to their individual lives, but as young women and how that impacts the whole entire country. Uh, I've read plenty of articles that suggest South Africa produces plenty of great athletes, yet irrespective of that continued investment of time, energy, money into national sports, women continue to be underrepresented and receive the least amount of support as athletes. 
So for me, that's it's, it's so alarming because you know the, the the resources are there, but still women receive less. And I would like to know, um, uh, to, and I would also like to share with our listeners that there uh, in South Africa they were one of the first to declare the Brighton De- Declaration of Women in Sport. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with that, this is just a declaration or a set of laws that was passed to increase women's participation in sports. So. The, the, the following is there. Um, and so in addition to that, in 2007, South Africa passed the National Sport and Recreation Amendment Act to remedy inequalities in sports and recreation in South Africa by requiring uh, federations to make necessities available for women and disabled people to participate at the top levels of sport. Despite these efforts, all of these efforts, sports and gender uh, equality in South Africa has not yet been achieved. And I want to know, in your experience, growing up in South Africa as a young girl who's played sports, all types of sports, uh, and now a woman who uses the game to produ- promote peace and provide equitable experiences to youth in South Africa, what do you think South Africa and really the, ro- the world can do to help truly increase female participation in sports and help girls and women finally receive the support they need and deserve? Mm. I'm sorry, I went through that really fast, but I just, I just was, I needed, I needed to get that out because I know you, you have a vision. Amazing. Um, Yes, man, and it's amazing. Like you're saying, there's a lot of, um, a lot of good governance, so good documents that have been allowed to promote this. uh, That is, it's still a struggle in South Africa. Uh, um, as you mentioned, they are still not getting paid. Our football team, our ladies' team is more successful than the men's team. Uh, it's still uh, rec- amateur. They don't get paid uh, to participate, yet um, uh, the male counterparts are getting paid so much money. <clears throat> uh, I think maybe I'll just go back to even the demographics of the country. In South Africa, just racially, um, that South Africa is 73% black. Uh, about uh, 14% white, 9% colored, uh, and also the races that uh, live in South Africa right now. What is a big challenge with, that is, with those dip, the decrepancies that we have in the country is that the economy does not get to the majority uh, of the people in the country. So what we have realized is that uh, to date, a lot of uh, black communities are still regarded as underserved communities with no access to, to resources. There is yeah, also culture yeah. contribution as well to this. Um, uh, with your parents being Nigerian, I'm sure you, they might have shared some stories that women, I remember when I started playing with peace players, I only played for two months when I was in high school because I had duties and chores to do at home. I had to pick up my sister right. from school. I had to cook for my family. I had to do laundry. The girl is not supposed to be outside um, after 5 p.m., so there was all mm. of these challenges outside of natural challenges like your right. your period pains, your monthly period pains, not having proper uh, gear, sports bras, sneakers that uh, enable you to participate. Yeah. And then it goes up uh, uh, a notch when it gets also to, to government that we right. have all of these great constitutions and policies that are in place, yet they're not being monitored to make sure exactly. that uh, uh, these things are being implemented on the ground. Um, it's all well um, when it's written, uh, but practicing it and ensuring that every year these guys report back to say what they've done with their budgets. There's no one who's checking the participation yeah. of women and girls uh, of all races, um, especially mm. the underserved communities. Uh, recently, we just had the Olympics and the Paralympics. I'm sure you saw Team South Africa. Our ladies were leading uh, uh, world record holders, um, uh, you know. Uh, majority of our of, of our medals from our Olympics come from women, so the talent is definitely there, but the investment does not match the talent at all, right. especially right. when it comes to women. We still have a long way to go uh, as a country. At Peace Players, we're enforcing through our programs that we want 50-50 participation. Uh, the people that are able to make the decision makers, like myself as an executive director, we are those leaders that are necessary uh, to make those changes and make sure that these policies are being implemented and that women are given these opportunities because to date, um, it's still tough for girls to, to access, uh, especially participating opportunities where they play. So when I became executive director, for example, at Peace Players, <clears throat> our board was 95, was 95% male. 
I made it my duty to make sure that our constitution was revised uh, to enable us to have, to force us to have women representation in our board. And now it's 85% women. And it's still going to change to be 50% 50 because we want everyone's voice to be heard. So it's a very big conversation, but I want to, to encourage everyone to start with what you have and change what you can change. Don't worry about the government if they're not doing it, but from a small organization like us at Peace Players, those are the efforts that we are constantly making. We're telling our coaches, you need to recruit 10 girls, 10 boys. If you don't do that, then you're not doing a great job. You need to keep on encouraging girls to participate. Mm -hmm. And the biggest challenge that we have, uh, that we've experienced now in the country is that, for for example, with our program, uh, primary school and high school, we have these participants, but as they leave, once they go to university to work, there's so many responsibilities that are still put upon women. Uh, we need to get pregnant. We need to get married. I'm 33 years old. I don't have a child not married. Uh, ever so often I get asked, what is wrong with me? <laughs> uh, why am I not doing that? So there are so, uh, uh, social pressures as well that make women feel less if they continue to participate in sport, right. in sport and right. not focusing on their uh, on their lives and cooking and making babies or whatever right. else that they need to do. So we need to change what we can uh, one step at a time, controlling what we can control, um, continuing to have great uh, male advocates who are the supporters uh, of women in sport or encouraging women um, to not only participate, but also to lead in sport uh, so that they could be the people that are changing these policies that affect everybody else. Absolutely. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Great answer. Definitely with you. We definitely mm-hmm. need to dismantle these cultural constraints that are placed on women and the role of women. And just, yes, uh, it, everybody needs to be a part of it. And like you, we must use our platform, start where we are and really make it our duty to ensure that we are lifting up the voices of women, that we are supporting them and girls. We are doing everything that we can, making sure that there is a free space for both women and men to have voices. And I, that's awesome. Very awesome. I have so many different like angles of like points that I want to explore more from what you said. Um, uh, Before, because you touched upon sort of uh, peace players for you and sort of where you guys are trying to go. But before we get to that, I, I want to sort of take a step back and go back to um, the gender inequality in South Africa and sort of yeah. how I think a lot of people, when they think about the historical divides, don't think about gender inequality as being one right. of them. Right. Um, and so, you know, for me personally, I, I, you know, when I was a wee little fellow and I was talking to you on the phone about asking what, what research should I do? And you said, read Born a Crime, you know, try to, try to learn Zulu before you get here kind of thing. Um, I, I was, I was, I read, you know, Trevor Noah's book and it was very insightful about, you know, the historical divides in South Africa, but I was fortunate enough to be in South Africa and see, you know, okay, there's a lot more layers to this to this divide yeah. cake, if you will, than so there, than there, yeah. Mm. And uh, sadly, a lot of our listeners, a lot of people, aren't fortunate enough to be able to travel to South Africa to see firsthand, sort of, what those divides look like, and you know how are they implemented, and how are they trying to be um, dismantled in a way. Yeah. And so I think, Naz, if you could just like briefly, and try to. Um, simplify it as much as you could because it is so complicated and so intertangled um tell our listeners sort of besides gender inequality what what is the historical divide in south africa look like and sort of the the new divides that have developed because of that historical divide and then how are we trying to dismantle that i mean the second half of that question you kind of already answered so more so it's just the 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 first part of that question that i'm curious with for our listeners to know does that make sense yeah, 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 it makes sense. It makes, it makes sense. Good question. Uh, so the, the history of the divide in South Africa is apartheid, you know, over just 50 years ago, uh, when apartheid, for 50 years, we were under um, the apartheid lo- rules and laws in South Africa. Uh, black people were not allowed. Uh, there was a divide very similar to the U.S. Uh, between blacks and whites. You couldn't access a certain area if you were black. 
there was physical segregation. Uh, black people were kicked out of the cities and moved into more inland uh, where it's township or it is in the rural areas uh, and there to travel to work in the city. Uh, there was past laws that were put in place to just really discriminate uh, against uh, uh, black people just because of the color of their skin. And uh, all of that happened. And I think since 1994, when Nelson Mandela became our first president, uh, preaching that, uh, preaching unity, that mm. we need to find a way. Um, and he was a firm believer that sports really was that catalyst, uh, uh, the power to to change sure the world. Was. Yes, uh, definitely. And he he was that pillar of hope for the country, the person that led the country and the world really to believe in peace. Uh, in peace and in unity and in coming together. So the challenges that we've faced now 27 years, I think, since our democracy, um, uh, not much has changed. Uh, mm. If anything, our unemployment rate in the country, as I think it's about raging 34% of young people unemployed. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that means uh, higher risk of teenage pregnancy, HIV mm. and AIDS, um, that means crime, that means mm. drug and alcohol abuse, that means depression and other yeah. mental issues that young people are faced with. Um, people that have graduated universities and are sitting at home with uh, degrees and were not able to uh, get employment or skills to help them to be entrepreneurs. So the country is still very far back, um, especially when it comes to equality. So the, even if uh, equity is layered so much, there is mm -hmm. racial equity, there's economical equity or uh, accessing resources where people are not able um, to, to get uh, certain resources. Uh, you need to have money in order for you to access them. Uh, what I usually say jokingly is that uh, since our freedom, uh, what we, uh, we said, we're not shooting each other anymore. It's not apartheid time anymore. If you would like to access this, uh, you would like to live in this area or you'd like to access this area or this, even our schooling system is separated. There's private school and public mm. school. Public mm. school is for obviously us who don't have much money. And then private school is for the wealthy people, uh, mostly white people. And mm. uh, those few blacks uh, or Indians um, or colors who've made it, who are able to, to access um, that type of education or right. even sports academies in, in these mm -hmm. schools. Mm -hmm. So the country is still very much segregated. I'm sure you've seen more recently, we had the unrest um, yeah. with the looting and we're seeing, uh, it's like we're in a, uh, it's like a, a pot that is very full. Someone put a lid on it and it's a very shaky ground right now because we yeah. don't speak about our problems. Uh, these uh, inequalities that Peace Players uh, has been, um, we have been, somewhat successful successful through our program but there's still so much more work to be done uh, to right. dismantle it because right. there's so many issues and right. if these are country issues you can only think how much more women and children are affected by this yeah. um children um women uh women abuse in the country gender-based violence is every three wow. hours a woman is raped mm. um and wow. uh, a woman <clears throat> is killed. It's, it, the statistics are horrific. Um, they're very disheartening when you look at them, but that is our reality, um, our everyday that we are faced with, that we constantly have to uh, speak hope um, and to Internet. not just speak hope, but also to do hope and bring and show these young people that there is light at the end of that tunnel. Right, um, right, mm -hmm. right. Programs right. like the ones that we provided peace players it's still a very long way to go. There's still so much more work uh, that needs to be done. Uh, I remain very hopeful that uh, things will get better. We've seen them get better, but there's still quite a, a long way for us as a country to go. We need to prioritize uh, uh, organizations like Peace Players. And I'm not saying this because I'm a Peace Players. Uh, honestly, I truly believe in the work that I do. Uh, it has helped me from the dusty roads of the Eastern Cape. I'm the executive director right now. Not in my wildest dream, I thought that. I think I said it right. to the previous uh, executive director in 2009 that why they all have your job, <laughs> but I didn't even know <laughs> right. yeah. how I would even begin to go about that. And PSP has trained me uh, to, to make me what I am today. So it's still a very long way to go um, to bridge the gap. Uh, right. And all we can do is to be very intentional 
with our attempt to bridge that gap and that's what we continue to do at Peace Players. Yeah. Absolutely. No, that's that's really that's amazing. Um and, and since you you brought up Peace Players, uh Emin, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, I want to talk about uh, and explore, almost circle back to uh, an experience that you had as a peace player, um, and that is your fellowship uh, in Northern Ireland. Uh, and for those of uh, the listeners who don't know, Peace Players International has five sites. Um, they are the originator, the number one, South Africa, uh, Northern <laughs> Ireland, Cyprus, uh, the Middle East, and the U.S. Um, and and so it's so interesting to hear your story, but specifically because you were a fellow for Northern Ireland. And I, I want you to speak to us about your time there. Um, uh, and really, my true question here is, I'm just curious uh, to know how that experience helped you shape uh who and how you've led, who you are a little bit and how you've led uh, Peace Players South Africa as the executive director. And, and, and if you want, you can tie in all your other experiences as well, but I just wanna know how that, there's culture of collaboration there, that connection uh, between Northern Ireland and South Africa. So please share with us. Oh, definitely. Northern Ireland is my second home. <laughs> <laughs> I love it so much. It took me six months to adjust to the cold weather and rain, but <laughs> I would have not change it from an opportunity that I had. Um, part of me, I'm a very ambitious person. I truly believe that there's nothing I can't do. If I put right. my mind and my heart and my hard work to it, it's going to happen. Uh, yes, so back when yes. I was, a, uh, I uh, back when I was um, an area coordinator, I knew that I wanted to continue to work with peace players and part of the things that I wanted to do, we used to receive fellows, uh, especially from the US coming to South Africa. I was one of the first people to like, at least in my era, to challenge that and was like, well, how come we don't get to be fellows in other countries as well? <laughs> I would like to right. be a fellow. Uh, these guys right, do right, a right. cool job. I would like to do a cool job somewhere else as well. And fast forward in 2014, I got that opportunity. I applied for a fellowship at Peace Players Northern Ireland. Mainly, the main reason why I think I chose Northern Ireland, um, it was I just could not understand the the divide between Catholics and Protestants, especially right. because everyone is white. In comparison right. to South Africa, where in South Africa it's very easy, uh, the white person is an Indian person, colored person, or an Asian person. It's very easy for us to. You can physically see right. the, the segregation. Even when you're sitting in tables, um, mm -hmm. you can see how we interact with each other. So I couldn't understand how that was a divide in Northern Ireland until I got there. So that was my initial interest that right. I wanted to be able to see this. And when I got to Northern Ireland, I got to see, my Lord, I got to see it. I could <laughs> not believe they would literally be separated by as the, oh gosh, um a street you know and the ones like literally houses facing each other this side of the house is on the protestant side the side of the community is a catholic side the schooling systems are different everything yeah. is created in twos tv channels there's catholic tv channels there's protestant tv channels and i think the the greatest when i really realized this is when i went to a protestant school um uh, recruiting them to join peace players and I was sharing the different types of sport like Gaelic uh, or rugby, different sports that are played um, by other young people. I could not believe that in a Protestant school, they didn't know that the, the they didn't know that the Catholic sports even existed. Like they had no idea wow. what was Gaelic. And I'm like, I'm from South Africa. I know that. <laughs> like, right, right. Mm -hmm. Right next door. How do you not know that? Right. And right. that's when I got to I got to see it in these walls and all these different things uh, to understand the conflict in Northern Ireland. Uh, what was really good uh, and beneficial for me um, is first I got that uh, culture shock Emmet that you, you've spoken about, uh, where uh, it it was nothing like anything I'd imagined. Before I went to Northern Ireland, I didn't want people's perceptions uh, to influence my view of Northern Ireland. So I did as little research as possible because I wanted to experience it firsthand. Mm. And before me, I think when Peace Player started in 2001, uh, Ryan Dowie, who is a legend of Peace Players, he's a pilot now, and um, Togo Zisimadonda, who's a, a mentor and also sits in our 
board of trustees as well. They'd been to Northern Ireland before. So I was just curious and they, they told me some of their stories, but I was curious to experience it as Nasipi. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the great part that I got to do when I was in Northern Ireland, uh, they saw organized, especially in the administrative side, the behind the scene, like how to actually run a business, an organization. Mm -hmm. So Gareth took me under, he, under his wing uh, and mentored me. I credit a lot of what I've learned, especially from him, the rest of the uh, staff members, Laura's, Joanne, Debbie and other guys, but they really took me in and I was very persistent with saying that I want to know how to run an organization. And I got to see that behind the scene on how to draft budgets, how to, uh, how to be, um, I, I knew that part of my dream was wanting to be an executive director, but I didn't right. know if it would actually happen. Right. And I knew that if, uh, when I come back to South Africa, if there was an opportunity for me to uh, get to be in the management or senior management. I, I wanted to be um, a strategist because I'm quite a visionary and I've always known what PCS of Africa needs to be. So I wanted to be that person who was able to, to draw up that vision and help execute it. Because I don't like just dreaming. I like dreams that become reality. Right, right. Uh, so Northern Ireland gave me those resources, um, the, the behind the scene resources that you don't get to see every day. Yeah. Uh, behind, beyond just being a very good coach, being good with uh, building relationships with communities and young people, uh, I got to learn, um, I got to learn to be now, I'm an executive director and all yeah. of those skills really majority of them is due to my experience in Northern Ireland and um, seeing how things are done um, and how do you actually turn this mission and vision into reality by making sure that all parts of the organizations are counted to. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just had to check myself because I'm like in the camera because I'm just I just want to like get all your words <laughs> and everything you're saying because it's like, uh, you know, I can feel the light and the energy and that is uh, amazing uh, that you would even want to know uh, and stretch yourself in that way to, 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 to go and educate yourself uh, about divides beyond the color of skin, right? Yeah. Beyond yeah, yeah. racial divides, right? And really, yeah. you know, put yourself in the midst of other people's divides to learn your divide better, right? And how to execute. Yeah, and, and, Go ahead, and that's please, exactly please. what happened. I was like a different person because my yeah. perspective, even my understanding of the South African conflict, it changed. Right. Um, I used to be frustrated or bitter about certain things. And my perspective changed. I, I learned that in order for me, I cannot change. I cannot expect things to change. Right. I need to be part of that change, part yes. of that transformation. Mm -hmm. I right. need to immerse myself in order for things to change. Otherwise, no one's going to do it for me. And after right. I saw it in Northern Ireland and then I came back uh, in South Africa and other countries I've been, I realized, I remember when I was in America for the first time seeing organizations like Boys and Girls Club. And I was just like, what? We don't even have clubs. You clubs in South Africa. <laughs> right, uh, right. You know? uh, there's all right. of these things that the world has. If I did not get those opportunities to explore and see that, I would have stayed in my bubble with a very limited mind, thinking yes. that my problems when were so with South African problems and no one else had the problems that we had. Right. Uh, and I would have been very frustrated. But because of the light that I managed to, uh, all the light bulbs that I put up from all these different places I've been, right. now I'm able to 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 speak life uh, into right. things because I, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, mm -hmm. because I know that uh, the sun always rise. You know, I've seen it mm -hmm. rise in the different countries, in the Middle East, everywhere. And now I plug that to South Africa. Um, right. And I know the possibilities that really exist, and they they limit you know they limitless beyond beyond us beyond our time, and want to create right. things that last uh, forever and ever and change that is sustainable. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's what makes you a leader. Um, a leader is being able to understand that things exist past their own nose, right? That you're here to serve something greater than yourself. And if you can put yourself in other people's shoes, if you can see people as people, if you can go through that inside outside transformation where you can change the lens of how you're viewing the world and now adopt other lenses to view the world clearly, it's you a nasipi, a leader. Mm -hmm. um, and so thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, Emmett, I have another question, but I want to uh, give it to you no, if you want to no. go, because I can go. Bring us home. I, can, I, can bring, I go? I have, okay, some, so I have so much <laughs> stuff, but bring us home. Bring us <laughs> this home. This is a little bit more easy. fun. I have uh, just a couple more questions, but this one, uh, <laughs> I just want to give 
piece player South Africa its props and let our, our, our listeners know who and why and what they do. So for, for our listeners, Peace Players South Africa was established in 2001 to offer vital athletic, educational, and social opportunities to South African youth. Peace Players South Africa unites youth from diverse and divided communities through sustained sports-based programming led by committed local coaches grounded in leadership development and conflict transformation who believe if we can play together, we can learn to live together. This is just a fun question because I know no, you no. I know you don't know. That's my African voice. That's my <laughs> no. Um, what is the one thing that is a part of Peace Player South African program where peace players originated that you would share with all of the other sites just because it's so powerful and great? I mean, is it the the anthem? Is it the energy? Is it the dancing song and dance? What would you make mandatory <laughs> in all of the five, <laughs> the four other sites um, that South Africa? does that's just my fun question oh, for today. great gosh. question again uh, <laughs> i'm not biased here for other sites but <laughs> there tell us, tell is tell us. no place there is no place like peace Player south africa i don't know whether it's because it's in the continent of africa the second biggest continent in the world <laughs> But our energy, uh, the energy that we bring, our hunger, yeah. um, we we are we are hungry. We are hungry for Absolutely. knowledge. Absolutely. We are uh, we put ourselves out there, and South Africans we we dance a lot, uh, we sing a lot. The energy that we bring, uh, I'm sure during the friendship game, some of the twinnings, you might yes. have seen the energy that coaches bring. Uh, we truly just find ways to. Um, uh, uh, Trevor Noah makes a joke that one of the reasons why it took us, it took South Africa so long to be free from apartheid is because we always find ways uh, to, to make every situation, to find humor through every situation. <laughs> yeah. right, so when right. CNN or BBC, they came to South Africa, they heard there was uh, this conflict happening. They'll come with their cameras uh, and they say, as you can see behind us, uh, people are striking on the street, but was, as you can see, people behind us are dancing and singing. <laughs> uh, there's no issue. Right, right, right. <laughs> there's no issue because that's exactly who we are. We're a very resilient Absolutely. country. Uh, more than anything, our energy is unmatched. Yeah. Uh, you put us anywhere. I can't agree will, more. We will not agree more. We'll make it work. We'll make it fun. Um, yeah. So we have a lot of. Uh, great icebreakers that we'll share with all the yes. South Africans, uh, all yeah. the other PCR sites uh -huh. in Cyprus. They know some of them in Northern Ireland, and I'm sure US as uh, Fiso and the crew yeah. have shared in other countries as yeah. well. So our no, I, energy is unmet. Thank you. Completely <laughs> agree. There's a just the like uh, I got bringing it back to me because this this is all about me. This episode. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, the like coaches training Nas and like uh, just waking up and walking to work with Doug or quote unquote driving when I was learning how to drive stick, um, just energy. Like it was always like, and Ginny, I know this is going to be hard for you to believe, but I didn't have coffee in the morning. I didn't need it because I wow. would have just wow. this energy that was lifted from the people I was working with, like Tondo, Safiso, Sanele, uh, G Payne. Mm -hmm. It was just like, and the coaches training itself, it was so, uh, I, I, the only word I can use is infectious. Everyone was so happy and positive right, and right. laughing and dancing and chanting and right. dribbling basketballs in the office. But right. it was also like, you would always stay on task and it never, I would tell Doug this all the time. I was like, dude, I don't feel like I'm working at all. Like, I feel like right. this can't right. be a job what I'm doing right now. Right. Like I get paid to do this. I'm just like right. playing with friends right. right now. Like this is crazy. Um, so energy, yes. I completely second what Nas said. Yeah. The energy is just like, I'm with it. Out of this world. You know, I love energy and I love Peace Play South Africa because they have energy. So <laughs> for the other sites, I want you to know it is your own, your duty to bring yeah, the energy yeah. because right. Peace Player South Africa <laughs> is ready. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so- And, and just, uh, just sorry, Cheney, to, to, no to problem, disturb you. Know, I just wanted to, to, to echo what uh, Emmett was saying. And I know that like when you see that good vibe that energy uh, so high from everyone and then you get to to hear their stories to see yeah. where they come from it is 
unbelievable. It's like completely two op- opposite worlds where someone might have not had food. They might have walked for kilometers to, to get yeah. to the office or anything. But how they bring themselves and represent themselves, uh, I guess it, it could be through like that resilience where they, they come and show up 100% every day right. and with a big smile you wouldn't even know what is going on until you actually go see um, the, the house the, the makeshift house that they're staying in with, mm-hmm. with not even electricity or just candles and you're like how can someone who stays under right. such conditions right. be this happy and be this optimistic and this positive yeah. uh, so it's just something that I think it's engraved uh, in our South African DNA really to just and, always and- um See that and Naz, I thank you so much for bringing that up because I wanted to bring it up earlier on in our conversation. Yeah. That it's it's almost like a paradox, Chinny and Naz, in terms of like you experience so much trauma, or if you do experience trauma at such an early age or any time in your life, it usually, hopefully, at least with South Africa, there was always a sense of like these distinct two different worlds like one like Nas your story in particular you had all this immense resilience and trauma that you had to deal with and it shaped you into this incredibly inspirational like uh incredibly empathetic compassionate person and it's sort of a paradox but at the same time there has there's so many lessons that are learned from that yes totally Mm. shapes who you are Mm. in the future Mm -hmm. and so it was it was yeah, like I, I remember going to certain schools or seeing G Payne's where G Payne lived and just like being, it was like getting hit with a ton of bricks because it was just so starkly different from his personality. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah. That's why, I, you, you guys, this is just, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> save it for that, but this has been amazing. And that's why I brought the proverb, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, because it's true, like what uh, you see on the outside may not be what is truly going on in the inside, but still there's that glory, still there's that hope, still there's that energy. And that's what South Africa embodies for me. And I just wanna bring it home with this last question, uh, this this deeper question, this almost drop the mic question uh, to see the deal here. Um, and this is probably one of my favorite questions to ask our guests because it requires some co- type of deeper inner reflection of who you are now um, and, and to, to really reflect on who you were back then, uh, trying to figure out your space in the world. Nasiba, you, Nasiba you, you mentioned trying to figure out your purpose and making sure your life is aligned with that and how we fit. And, and that question is, what would you say to the younger Nas who is trying to survive? The younger Nas who is trying to make a way where there seems to be no way, what would your advice be to her? What would you? What would your words be to encourage her to keep going, to keep scratching, to keep finding that hope? What are we saying to to little Nas? Because li- there are so many little Nas's all over the world that need that <laughs> message. Sure. Wow. Uh, good one. Good. Good. Good reflection mm-hmm. moment here. And I, I think I, I started doing some of this recently. Um, I said earlier, like I had to be a grown up from the age of 18. Yeah. So I feel like I sort of missed out uh, in some part of my childhood. I just had to be this, this grown up. Um, one thing I would say to little Nas is to be kind to yourself. Yes. Um, um, and uh, to just, first is to be kind, to keep dreaming. Yeah. Uh, because girl if you can dream it you can have it Uh, i I usually say that god will never let you think about something that is not possible the fact that you're thinking about it already implanted that it's going to happen it's for you absolutely dream it um i wanted to be an executive director i'm an executive director now so it's all possible and i will tell something that i recently started doing um that I think has always been a challenge was to, to go, 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 because I was so scared of failing. I was so scared of not having food again. So scared of not having clothes and not uh, being able to to be in a city that I am now. Uh, something I started um, doing is I have a life coach now. I started really this year. I'm trying my very hard to really hold myself accountable to this, to really yeah. Uh, focus on healing myself so that I could heal others. 
yeah. uh, facing some of the traumas that I've, um, I've been avoiding or not dealing with because I've been so busy. So I'm learning to be still a little bit more. Um, I'm seeking professional help for people to help me um, untangle all of these wires uh, that are in my mind to deal with some of my childhood uh, traumas. Yeah. Uh, to to make me better so something that i wish i had done earlier was that that i wish um even my situation with my mom i wish when it happened um right there and then i, I wish i had received the support that i needed to yeah. to deal with that trauma i, I mm. think it took me years i was in a program the laureus yes program with in togo um in 2012 and when a circle of support sharing our stories and something that we and that they were speaking about grief um death and grief and how do you overcome and i just remember shutting down and i used to mm. just have it was like a, a shutter door or like a wall where i would just close off because i didn't want to talk about it i didn't want to face it and he asked me a question that what if one of the children that you're coaching had suffered a loss and grief how do you then help them if you can't help yourself mm. right mm -hmm. so be kind start from within dream big um uh there's no limits uh to what you can achieve mm. and with that being said that is our drop the mic moment and i won't even repeat it because how you said it was exactly how it needs to be said right cp thank you so much uh for sharing your story for sharing your life and using your platform to serve something far greater than yourself you mm. are a leader you're phenomenal uh, and You're we queen. ask, and since you mentioned God, um, we ask that he continues to enrich your platform. He heals you. Um, and that everything that you set your mind out to do, you do because we know that it's not just you, but you are a representative, representative of many. So we wish you all that great energy and that love and that peace. And we thank you so much for being on the show today. Yeah. And you didn't even, you didn't even drop the mic. You threw that crap to the ground. <laughs> it went through the floor. So yes. thank you thank for you. that. Thank you. Thank oh you. My thank God. you. Thank you. Yeah. No, no, it's always a pleasure. So much, thank you for, yeah. for the opportunity. You, uh, you are phenomenal. I cannot believe that as people have just started this podcast, this podcast now and really, mm -hmm. really honored to get an opportunity to, to be here. I know you've had some really uh, distinguished guests that have done a fantastic job. I hope and trust that my story uh, would have um, uh, been powerful and has helped. Yes. Uh, oh, stop it. Of course. Yes. What are you of talking course. about? Please. Yes. On their lives and more than anything, they need to come to South Africa. Yes. Well, yes. Woo! I'm coming. I, me and Jenny are coming. We, we yes. promise. We <laughs> Thank promise. You. Yeah. Um, if South you want to look for flights for us, for us, well, we're open. Yeah, we, yeah. We, we're, we're, we're open to that open. if you want. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And that's it for today's episode. Thank you all for listening and joining us on this amazing and magnificent journey. If you like what you heard, we encourage you to like and subscribe. We've got so many more brilliant, amazing conversations and stories to share in the coming weeks. And like I always say, share with a friend, like a review, like the Mighty Lion who says, a spectacular show. Great guests covering interesting topics. Love how they relate it back to youth and how they can all, how we can all improve. Excuse me there. Oh my God. That being said, um, Emmett, what are your uh, thoughts on the show? Uh, <laughs> that's my singing scream. Uh, thank you, Mighty Lion. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> wow, she is just so bad ASS, if you know what I mean. And like, uh, <laughs> I can't get enough of her. Her energy is so infectious. Wouldn't it, you agree? It really is. It really, uh, really is. It's, you know, it you was... can learn. Oh, no, no, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. No, sorry, mean, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Tell us how the, we can learn. Tell us how we can learn. I mean, if you want to know more about what she and Peace Players South Africa is doing, you can find us, Peace Players South Africa. Their handle on Instagram is peaceplayers underscore SA. So check them out. They're doing a lot of big things, dealing with a lot of different issues, but they're they're getting the ball rolling for sure. And uh, you follow us also on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube. You know what I'm going to say. MySpace, <laughs> Tumblr, uh, Visco. No, none of those. Nobody uses those anymore. So right, let's move right. on. Um, you know, season two, I thought I'd get better at this, but I no, gotta go lay are. down. That was, that was just, oh, yeah. oh my <laughs> God. I gotta she lay down so and powerful. stare at the ceiling. She is yes. so powerful. She's vulnerable. Yeah, like, 